So my name is Carl Gay. I'm a thoracic medical oncologist at, at MD Anderson Cancer Center uh, in, in Houston, and I'm joined by Jennifer Eads from UPenn for this final session on immunotherapies in neuroendocrine neoplasms. Uh, and, you know, just as, by way of brief introduction, I think uh, a lot of us in this room have sort of uh, been witness over the last decade plus to the resounding successes that immunotherapy have offered, immunotherapies have offered patients with solid tumors. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, whether it's NETS or NEX, uh, I think we've mostly been relegated to consolation prizes and you know, standing along the sidelines. Uh, and so I think it's unfortunately not going to be quite so simple with these diseases as just adding immune checkpoint uh, inhibitors. And so uh, I think we're going to hear in this next session, uh, that sounds like I'm starting off on sort of a downer. I think there's <laughs> reason, reason for optimism, uh, and I think we're going <laughs> to... <laughs> going to get yanked off the stage with a cane. Uh, but I think there's reason for optimism here. I think it's going to require some creativity. And, and this session includes uh, several talks get, getting at that, whether it's rational combination therapies, uh, adoptive cell therapies, um, or more novel agents like, like T-cell engagers, um, or even employing CRISPR-Cas9. So really excited to see some of the inventive ways that folks have, have found to engage the immune system into these tumors that um, otherwise seem to be resistant to our, our best efforts. Um, and so with that, I'll, I'll introduce the first speaker. And so um, coming to us from INSERM, uh, we have Jerome Crow, um, who is going to be talking to us about temozolomide um, and, and its ability to induce a hypermutator uh, effect and increase the tumor mutational burden, I'll bet. I do. Can you hear me? Yeah. So thank you very much for the, uh, letting us present our, our, our work today. So yeah, we, we were interested in um, finding, so this is my disclosure. Um, we, we were interested in, in finding what's the effect of alkylating agent in neuroendocrine tumors. You know that they come in different flavors, the streptozotosin for the chemoembolization, uh, you have the cabazine temozolomide, and if you look at the recommendation of the ESMO, uh, you see that the temozolomide is sort of all over the place, so it's a pretty used drug, and, you, and you've seen this uh, Kaplan-Meyen curves many, many times, but it does offer uh, to patients uh, prolonged survival, um, especially if you can, uh, actually we can discuss this afterwards, but if you can uh, select them with uh, some biomarker. So how is uh, temozolomide and alkylating agent working? Well, most of the DNA damage that they do on N3 and N7 on, on the, uh, the guanine and the alanine is actually being repaired by the BER system, which is often functional in tumors, so this is not a, an issue. But you do get some alkylating uh, a sort of methyl group addition on the O6 uh, of, of the guanine, and this can actually be removed by a normal enzyme that is expressed by any uh, cells in the body, which is the MGMT, it's the O6 methyl guanine methyl transferase. And if you have this enzyme that's being expressed in the tumor, it's, it's a sort of a repairing the DNA, and your tumor is you know, not sensitive to temozolomide, but if it's absent, then uh, I can show this here. Uh, then the, uh, actually during the replication, this, this alanine is sort of mistaken for uh, a cytosine and then you get a timing uh, before. And then so this activates the MMR system and that will try to repair this and make some futile break and repair cycle. And at the end, you will sort of have a lot of double strand break DNA and the, 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 the neuroendocrine tumor cells will die. But if you do happen to be deficient for the MMR, then this sort of mismatch will not be seen. And then when the cell will replicate, then this mutation will be carried on to the uh, sister cell and, and you will induce a lot of, of, of mutations. So this is known uh, that this hypermutagen mutagenetic uh, effect of temozolomide in several tumor, and one of them is the uh, glioblastoma. It's been sort of really well studied with very deep omic studies of before and after temozolomide samples. And what they saw that in about 15 to 20%, they have this hyperprogressor and hypermutator phenotype after a temozolomide. And this is sort of always related to uh, acquired mutation in the MMR gene and the most frequent, uh, which is in about 15 to 20% of cases, is a very peculiar MSH6 dominant negative mutation that it's been seen uh, in glioblastoma. So the issue with this is that, well, you can say maybe we are inducing this hypermutator phenotype so we can make the tumor hot and we can treat them with ICI. The problem is that the small clinical trial that has been done in glioblastoma were not so uh, successful. But uh, in advanced colorectal cancer, the sort of the, the history looks a bit different. 
There is few trials where they try to, in third or fourth line, to prime patients that were MMR, uh, the MGMT deficient, but they were MMR proficient. So they try to prime them with temozolomide to make them a more sort of uh, hypermutator and, and more sort of immunologically hot. And then they treat them with uh, immunotherapy. And you might have seen this, this, uh, the, the, this Maya trials in, <clears throat> and, and some other studies where they, they did see in colon cancer when they sort of primed them with temozolomide an increase after the temozolomide treatment in the tumor mutational burden. So sort of the question we, we, we had was, what this is, is this happening in, in neuroendocrine tumors? And when you look, and there is a lot of, of, of information that was given to you in the, the, prior, the prior session, is that uh, we do find more or less the same numbers that was, was said before, is that there is progression from G1 to G2 and then to G3 in at least a third of, of the patients. And when you look at these uh, multi-sample studies, and this is, this is from, from, from our group, uh, when the KI67 is increasing, then the, uh, the, the prognostic is, is becoming poor. And when you ask what is associated with this great progression, the drug that is the most associated with this drug progression is, is temozolomide. And this is exactly what uh, was found also in the Nordic group with the, the bottling studies where the, the temozolomide was sort of associated with the increase in uh, KI67. So what we asked was what, what's the biological effect of temozolomide on these pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors? And so to sort of do this, we looked at patients that were metastatic. They, were, they had to be G1 or G2. Uh, when they were sort of treated by temozolomide. They were MGMT deficient because we use this in our center to stratify the patients. So they're all MGMT deficient to be treated with temozolomide. Um, they all had temozolomide, of course, and we remove all the patients that were upfront resistant. So we only took patients that were exposed to temozolomide for a long time. So this is a monocentric studies. And uh, what we wanted is to have sample before temozolomide and after temozolomide, and we wanted to have no other DNA damaging uh, treatment between those two samples. Uh, so we can only look at what temozolomide is doing. Um, so we took those samples, we, because they were all FFP sample for most of them, and they were sort of, some of them were really old. Uh, we did a, a 600 gene panel, uh, which is two megabase. Uh, so it's for the, TMB uh, sort of assessment, it's not as good as the exome, but uh, this is a clinical panel and, and the, the, the rate of uh, more than uh, 30 mutations per uh, megabase uh, that uh, is being used in, in this clinical panel. And, and uh, we, we, I'll discuss this, we, we were fortunate uh, to actually collaborate with Foundation Medicine to have sort of an independent cohort to look at, at these findings. So this is what we worked. We, we had about a, a hundred patients that, that matched the criteria. Uh, we removed those with, uh, that didn't have upfront resistance. And then um, you see the numbers, it's about half that become a G3, but there's a bias because we do re biopsy the patient that becomes uh, sort of more aggressive. Then when we removed the, the patient for which we have before and after sample, with no DNA damaging, only temozolomide, and that left us with a smaller cohort of 20 patients. Now we have 25. Um, and, and the most important thing that we look clinically, are they different? The patient that remain G1, G2 after temozolomide, that the patient that become G3 after temozolomide. And there were actually no difference in uh, the KI67 before the temozolomide. There was no difference in the pretreatment. There was no difference in the dose of temozolomide that they had received. And I think this is very important. OK. Uh, unexpected, I mean, this is expected. As soon as you become G3 uh, after temozolomide, then uh, this is a, sort of a bad news. Uh, your overall survival becomes, uh, you know, poorer, whether you, you look at uh, from the start of your temozolomide treatment to after the temozolomide treatment. So this is what we, we, we worked with. So we had 20 patients uh, treated with temozolomide. Uh, for few of those patients, uh, they, they, they responded pretty well. We stopped, then we re-challenged them, and then we had this, an, another biopsy. So that led us to sort of for some patients, a dual sort of couple of pre and post uh, temozolomide treatment. And, and as you can see, so th those 
those were all G1, G2, except for those two samples, which are here, that became even more aggressive. And you can see the KS67 is increasing in some sample and in not, but you can see really strong uh, progression of KS67 in some, some sample. So then the question we asked was, what's, what's different between those samples? When, when you look globally uh, at the whole cohort, you don't see many, many different genes. The only thing is, is sort of, mTOR pathway alteration, which is mostly copy number alteration of TSC1, TSC2, and a few mutations. But when you, when you start looking at, is it something different between the tumor that stayed low grade between, and, and the tumor that become high grade? Uh, can we predict sort of this progression and maybe not give demosolomides to those ones? Well, uh, we did not find any uh, genes that were different. Uh, we looked at every single gene. We tried to regroup them by pathway. We tried to look at, at uh, sort of global chromosomal arm loss gain. And, and we didn't find anything that can predict this progression before the temozolomide treatment. There was no difference in the uh, ADM status. So as of today, we have no way to, to uh, sort of predict who's going to become G3. Then we sort of looked at uh, what's driving this progression and similarly to what was seen uh, before, it's actually extremely, extremely heterogeneous, meaning each sort of patient has his own path towards uh, the, the G2 progression. You can group those into uh, unexpectedly, uh, of course, uh, cell cycle alteration and, 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 and alteration in the MAP kinase pathway. If you look, you, you lose the, the usual suspect. You lose, you lose a lot uh, check one, check two in the G3. You lose CDK in 2A you activate and have some amplification of CDK4, CDK6. You do find some strange after temozolomide Keras mutation, some MET mutation, but every single patient is different. We didn't find any sort of common um, you know, alteration that would drive this uh, G3 um, progression. So then we, we sort of ask, well, so, Temozolomide is sort of responsible for this hyperprogression, but is it also responsible for these hypermutation phenotypes? And so when you look at the whole cohort, the, the TMB doesn't seem to uh, increase very much, but when you look at every single couple of before and after temozolomide, you do find a subgroup of patients who actually have a, a strong increase in the uh, tumor mutational burden and, and some that, did, that do not. And when you compare these two groups unexpectedly, the patient that did become a hypermutator, they all had mutation in the MMR gene, but that was sort of much more different than when was, what was seen in glioblastoma. We never found this MSH6 very specific glioblastoma mutation that they actually see in colorectal cancer as well. We had some PMS2, some MSH6, very, very different, but all these samples, they always have alteration in the uh, MMR gene. But what was surprising is that they, they none of them were sort of MSI high using the classical um, sort of algorithm that we use in colorectal cancer, the, uh, the pentaplex or the uh, MSI sensor. Uh, so this is sort of hypermutation, hypermutator tumor, but MSI low. Um, we, we started looking at the intratumor heterogeneity and it's massive after temozolomide. When we have surgical specimen after temozolomide, you'll see some area where the MSH6 is, is lost. And this, in those areas, we do see an infiltration in, in CD8. And this is the same tumor. This is the area when MSH6 is not lost. And then you see there is actually no uh, CD8. So that sort of tells you that maybe this area you know, might be a good responder if you treat with ICI, but maybe this one will not. And this heterogeneity is uh, actually very, very frequent. Sometimes in, in the same tumors, you will have one area with MSH6 loss and another area with PMS2 loss. It, it, it's very, very, very subclonal. So um, we had the chance to work with Foundation Medicine to try to validate our, our, our findings. So they had about uh, a thousand pinnets that they sequenced. In those thousand pinnets, they had about 25 that were, you know, with a high TMB, with using the same cutoff as, as us. Um, and, and when they, they looked, you know, in the, there is some signatures that you can look in the DNA that are sort of related to uh, what was the, uh, the founding event of, of the mutation and the signature 11 is associated with alkylating agent. And so most of these TMB high sort of tumors, they were uh, with uh, an alkylating signature 11. They had mutation in MMR in sort of most of the case. And we 
sort of asked the other question around. We said, oh, can you look at the, uh, the tumors that have this signature 11 that's really high? And when you look at those, all the, 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 the timozolomide signature is associated with an increase in, in the TMB. So I think we can sort of really conclude that similarly to glioblastoma, this sort of hypermutator phenotype is really uh, timozolomide related in uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. So to, to, to summarize, the, the temozolomide is sort of associated with two things in PANET. There's hyperprogression in some tumor, hypermutation in other tumors. Sometimes it's both. Um, but those, the two are not completely uh, linked, and I think this is important. When you see this increased uh, TMB with MMR gene mutation, maybe they are more immunogenic. We are trying to, to sequence the TCR of those uh, tumor infiltrated uh, T cells we'll see. Uh, we see. We do see when, when you rebiopsy that the, the, and I encourage you to rebiopsy that we see this uh, temozomite progression in about maybe a third of the case uh, at least. And so this really raised the question, sh should we try immunotherapy in these TMB high post temozolomide uh, tumors, the glioblastoma says no, the uh, colon cancer experience says, you know, maybe. Um, and, and I think it's, uh, we're we trying to, uh, if you're interested, to try to put together, because I think we each of us have few, one, two cases of those post-temozolomide treatment patient treated with, with ICI. And I think it would be good to try to put them all together to sort of try to get a, a signal to whether it's, it's worth it or not to uh, go into a, a clinical trial and how to design it. So uh, if you want to send an, an email and uh, then we can discuss, try to put those cases together. So this, all the work I presented is from uh, the, the PhD thesis of, of Louis de Mestier. And I wanted to thank the Cure Institute, which who we did the uh, Sequencing the, the folks at Foundation Medicine who uh, gave us their uh, sort of validation cohort, which I think really strengthened the, the, the message and the uh, net RF on the, the, the funding of this uh, project. Thank you very much. We probably have time for maybe one question here, if, if, if folks have a quick question. Or maybe two quick questions. Okay, okay. I don't want to leave disappointed. Yeah, just a, I think we're seeing different things in, by different groups depending on you know who's presenting on um, grade progression. And I wonder if part of it is um, understanding the reason for the second biopsy. And so, you know, sometimes a second biopsy is acquired in the setting of good biology because the patient's undergoing surgery and you get a second biopsy that way. Many times in the setting of IR, it might be because of horrible biology, and so they're getting a percutaneous biopsy. So it's just, I guess, a plea to everybody that we should all be try to characterize why the second biopsy is done. Um, in your case, were they mostly due to clinical behavior change? Yeah, we, okay. we, we did look at the, I mean, some, some the surgery, no. That is, so we, we have both, and I don't know exactly the, the ratio between that depends. Uh, most of the biopsy, yeah, they were done because the, the, the clinical evolution were, were poorly. We did look at the patients in, in the cohorts of whether the patient that went too poorly that we didn't rebiopsy them, because that could also have been a bias. But in the temozolomide treatment, all the patients that we didn't rebiopsy, they didn't show any clinical sign of, of, of G3 evolution. So that's why I think the, our numbers of sort of 30% of, of evolution is I think what you have as well. It's, it's probably yeah. more or less. Uh, yeah, and relevant. the other interesting thing I would say is I didn't, um, I, I saw you, so you selected for defective MGMT in all of your patients, which is yes. really interesting. And it, it's an important distinction because in other places that's not routine to do. And so I don't know whether that has anything to do with the results that you're seeing, but it's an important distinction that it's a population of entirely um, defective yeah, MGMT. I, I, I think Thank you're you. right. This is, this is important because if you if you do if you don't select if you have you know, probably a, a, you know working MGMT in your tumor cells, probably you're going to be able to repair your DNA much better, and probably you may not end up with this phenotype, but you should not end up with a sort of a long. Uh, progression-free uh, survival under... I mean, we, we are strong believers that the MGMT is a, a good predictor of temozolomide efficacy, but it's true that similarly as the all the colon cancer work, they only worked on MGMT deficient uh, patient for the inclusion in their trial. Yeah. 
All right, I think we're going to have to maybe defer, but at the end, um, certainly we'll take some additional questions. So thank you very much for that very interesting talk. Um, so moving on, um, we have Maura Cives from um, the University of Bari, um, who will be speaking to us about TILS from pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor liver metastases um, in search of novel adoptive transfer strategies for the treatment of NETS. Good morning, everyone. And uh, first of all, let me express my gratitude to the organizing committee of NET uh, Research Foundation Symposium 2023. It's truly a privilege to be here to present our data on, on uh, how our uh, NET REF uh, funded project uh, aimed at developing a possible new uh, adoptive T cell therapy for uh, NET patients. Multiple forms of uh, adoptive T cell therapies have been investigated so far in oncology, spanning from uh, sick and uh, lax cells to uh, most recent ones, including uh, CAR T cells, TCR engineered T cells, as well as TILs, that stands for uh, tumor infiltrating uh, lymphocytes. TO mutations are a key substrate for the generation of uh, anti tumor immunity, leading to the development of uh, new antigens. Once presented by HLA molecules, the new antigens are able to elicit a potent and specific anti-tumor immune response. Tumor new antigen reactive T cells have been um, observed and detected in a, a variety of malignancies, and it is nowadays possible to identify, isolate, and expand new antigen reactive T cells. You can use TILs in uh, different ways. This is one possible approach. So the bulk of TILs is uh, infused back into the patient for therapeutic purposes. And this is a pivotal trial that was presented uh, at the ESMO 2022 by Hanen uh, that uh, clearly showed the superiority of uh, TILs um, uh, versus uh, ipilimumab in patients with uh, metastatic melanoma. But another possibility is to uh, select uh, tumor neontigen reactive uh, TILs uh, as done here in uh, this work uh, conducted at the NIH within the Rosenberg's uh, group uh, in uh, patients with uh, breast cancer. And uh, notably in uh, uh, this trial, they noticed uh, uh, several complete response in uh, heavily pretreated patients with uh, breast cancer. In uh, our study, we aimed at uh, testing uh, the therapeutic potential of uh, neontigen reactive uh, T cells uh, against uh, pan nets. Um, what we did is that uh, we tried to uh, isolate and uh, expand uh, T cells from uh, pan net uh, liver metastasis, and then uh, we will. Um, uh, use a multimer approach to select the T cells that express TCRs with a specificity against uh, specific tumor new antigens. And then uh, we want to uh, test the activity of these TILs uh, against uh, autologous tumoroids. Um, these are the inclusion criteria. Uh, so we have included patients with uh, well differentiated G1, G2, G3, uh, pancreatic nets, metastatic uh, to the liver. Um, any prior line of therapy was allowed, um, provided that uh, fresh or cryopreserved samples of uh, tumor tissue, in particular panet liver metastasis, was available, along with blood and uh, FFP tumor tissue. These are the uh, patient and uh, tumor characteristics. So, so far we have enrolled 22 uh, patients. Um, in particular, uh, the median age at the diagnosis was uh, 65 years. Um, the grading, uh, so a prevalence of G2 uh, tumors. Uh, as you can see here, uh, there were uh, 13 patients with G2 tumors, uh, five with G1, and four with well-differentiated G3 uh, nets. And notably, the median interval from 
from diagnosis to till uh, resection, well, to the resection of the tumor, was uh, only six months, uh, reflecting the fact that uh, only one median line of treatment, uh, um, that the patients receive only one uh, line of treatment. And I would say that uh, it's important to emphasize that most of these patients received only somatostatin analogs. So on, uh, we don't think that this might have an impact uh, on both the genetic um, features of the tumor and the systemic and the local immune features uh, of the tumor. The first question that uh, we posed ourselves was, what are the key immunological characteristics uh, of the samples that we included in, uh, in our court? First of all, uh, what is the degree of T cell infiltration? in our samples. And so we asked our pathologists to stratify our samples in uh, uh, till high, till low. And now uh, here you can see, uh, sorry, clear differences between the different samples. So we had like approximately 60% of till low samples and 40% of the high samples. And in particular, we saw the presence of uh, uh, tertiary lymphoid structures in approximately 15% uh, of samples. Two of them were in uh, uh, till high uh, samples and one in uh, till low uh, sample. Then we wanted to have a better understanding of the uh, density of the tumor infiltrate. And uh, we used a software that is named Aperio uh, that works on uh, digital pathology or slides, um, basically to profile the density of the T-cell infiltrates in uh, different tumors. So here, here, here I'm showing only uh, 10 of the, the 22 uh, tumors that we studied. And uh, as you can see here, there is a deep difference uh, uh, between uh, different tumors in terms of the uh, uh, number of T-cells per area. Another crucial aspect, as I already pointed out, uh, uh, when we uh, think about uh, tumor immunity uh, is the expression of uh, HLA class 1 and uh, class 2. And uh, uh, when we looked at the, our cord, uh, we found that 95% uh, uh, of the samples expressed HLA class 1, but none of our samples uh, expressed HLA class 2. Uh, obviously, we want to have a, big, a better picture of this, so we are expanding uh, our court. Um, but it's really intriguing to see that uh, uh, pan-net liver metastasis seems to lose completely the expression of HLA class 2. Uh, and if you see here, and there are some tiny uh, black spots, uh, and like obviously these, uh, these are like uh, inflammatory cells or endothelial cells that retain the expression of uh, HLA class 2. And uh, this also uh, gives an idea that the immunostatomacy reaction was, uh, was okay. We then performed the uh, wall exon sequencing and uh, uh, RNA-seq of uh, our samples, uh, and we are currently uh, using uh, this data um, in order to uh, uh, predict the presence of uh, neoantigen using a, a neoantigen um, a prediction pipeline that we have developed uh, in-house. Uh, based on uh, prior ex experience, uh, um, we expect a median of five um, neoantigen uh, bound to a HLA class 1 and 6 new antigens bound to a HLA class 2. Um, at least this was our experience in a primary PANET. Maybe in a PANET liver metastasis, uh, we could see something uh, more than, uh, than that. The second question was, are we able to expand clinically meaningful numbers of TILs from PANET liver metastasis? We adopted uh, different protocols of TIL isolation and uh, expansion. And uh, as you can see here, both uh, tumor digests with or without uh, different protocols at the gentle max or um, in vitro culture of wall fragments, so-called microcultures. Uh, early steps of enrichment uh, versus late CD3 enrichment versus no enrichment uh, whatsoever. Uh, low interleukin-2 versus high interleukin-2 versus interleukin-7, 15 or uh, stimulation with uh, CD4TL versus no stimulation with CD4TL. Well, but to make a long story short, uh, here you see the results that we got. So basically uh, we had 12 samples uh, 
which we had fresh tumors and uh, 12 with uh, uh, cryopreserved tumors. You see that the sum is 24, so more than uh, the number of samples of patients, because like in, for, some pa for some patients, we had uh, more samples, some cryopreserved and some uh, fresh. But bottom line, uh, three major messages here. First, as you can see here, um, with cryopreserved samples, there is a clear superiority of IDOS interleukin-2 for some reasons, whereas in uh, fresh, fresh tumors, uh, both uh, low-dose and high-dose interleukin-2 work uh, very well uh, alone or with uh, CD40L. Um, a second point that I want to stress is that there is a clear superiority uh, in terms of T-cell yield when we use fresh tumor samples uh, versus uh, cryopreserved uh, tumors. Um, and this is also recapitulated in this slide where you see the raw number of uh, tails uh, that uh, we achieved when using, uh, uh, that we obtained when using fresh versus frozen samples and the time to cryopreservation. Uh, basically, uh, you know, like when you use uh, adopted T-cell therapy approaches, uh, uh, when you reach the number of clinically meaningful uh, cells, you need to uh, cryopreserve them. And as you can see here, the median time to cryopreservation was significantly lower in uh, fresh versus cryopreserved uh, samples. So just to summarize this uh, first point, uh, we got a sufficient number of TILs uh, pre-rapid expansion phase uh, in 10 out of uh, 22 tumors, that means uh, approximately 45%. Uh, when you look sorry, at the difference between uh, fresh and uh, cryopreserved, you have 67% of success rate versus 33% of success rate with uh, higher numbers, um, both median and uh, average in fresh versus cryopreserved. Uh, and when you compare the success rate that we obtain with uh, other cancer, for example, renal cell carcinoma, 38%, uh, but like, for example, breast cancer or melanoma, it's 90%. So it really depends on how you want to look at the, at the glass. Um, Overall, we found a very high heterogeneity in terms of T-cell yield with the high inter-individual variability, high intra-individual variability, namely different lesion, uh, lesions in the same patient, uh, and high intra-lesional variability. And, uh, on the other hand, there was no difference in terms of uh, T-cell yield uh, on the, uh, based on uh, tumor grading, KI-67, vascular invasion, perineural invasion, or prior therapies, whereas there was a significant correlation between the T-cell yield and the T-cell density as assessed by immunostochemistry, as I've shown uh, before. Um, and the T-cell yield and the presence of uh, tertiary lymphoid structures in particular, when you got these uh, tertiary lymphoid structures, basically you can be sure you, you will obtain uh, a tons of uh, T cells. But can we dissect the intratumor heterogeneity to increase the T cell yield? So what we did is that uh, um, we tried to create a map of the tumor and to dissect the tumor so that we knew exactly uh, which T cells were coming from uh, a certain region uh, of the tumor. Um, so basically, uh, we knew exactly in each well uh, which region of the tumor uh, we had. And then we quantified the tilts that uh, we got, uh, and then we uh, characterized them, and uh, we knew exactly uh, that they were from a certain area. Sorry. Um, so just to give you an example, um, in this uh, case, uh, the, the presence of uh, T cells uh, was confined to this part uh, of the sample, and uh, as you can see here, we were able to uh, obtain tails uh, only uh, from the upper part uh, of the tumor. Like obviously, this is a simplification. I am aware of that, but. Uh, so, just to summarize some points, T cell yield varies according to the tumor region. There is a positive correlation between uh, stromal rather than uh, tumor areas and uh, tails of growth in vitro, uh, and uh, 
prior uh, amatoxylin and eosin uh, evaluation can help maximizing the T-cell yield. Uh, basically, if we know that the T-cells are there, we should look there. It's pointless to uh, uh, put in culture uh, tumor regions that uh, don't have uh, TILs. Um, obviously, like uh, some questions arise from, uh, from this, like for example, is there any functional difference between uh, stromal and uh, tumor infiltrating uh, lymphocytes? Uh, and does spatial location matters in terms of uh, uh, T-cell adoptive uh, therapies? But what are the immune uh, cell subsets of the TILs isolated from uh, pan-net liver metastasis? Um, so, obviously, the percentage of CD4 uh, positive uh, uh, cells increase over time in the culture and is quite expected. Uh, as you can see here, uh, at the beginning of the expansion, we had uh, uh, approximately 10% of uh, NK cells, uh, whereas uh, over time uh, there is a uh, drastic increase of the percentage of uh, T cell in culture, and uh, this is also expected. Um, uh, Regarding the tumor infiltrating T cell subsets, uh, we uh, like at, at day one uh, we have a similar number of CD4 and CD8 positive T cells, whereas over time there is a, a drastic increase of the CD4 positive component. Uh, and uh, when you look at the T Rex cells, uh, you find out that there are, like there is a percentage of approximately 20% of CD positive T Rex cells um, at the beginning of the expansion phase, so with a 10% of of CD8 positive uh, T-Rex cells. And when you compare these figures what, with, the, um, with what you find in, uh, healthy, in PBMC, in healthy donors, uh, or in PBMC from uh, net patients, you see that there is a trend towards the increase uh, in terms of, uh, uh, in particular, of CD8 positive T-Rex. So you can see here, in, uh, like the, 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 within the tumor, you have a higher number of, uh, higher percentage of CD4 and CD8 positive T-Rex cells as compared with the same patients uh, when you look at them. Uh, systemically in the blood. Um, we also looked at the differentiation state of uh, uh, T cells within the, uh, the tumor, and uh, you can see here that uh, for CD4 positive T cells, uh, there were mainly um, T effector memory, uh, whereas for CD8 positive T cells, you have a higher number uh, of uh, T effector uh, cells, at least uh, uh, until day seven, and then something happens and uh, there is a switch, and uh, we have like quite robust data on this. And what what we think is that under the selective pressure of interleukin-2, uh, you may lose the um, more terminally differentiated part of the T cells that are the T effector uh, because under the pressure of interleukin-2, they undergo apoptosis. But we also question ourselves, uh, apart the uh, differentiation uh, status, uh, can there be that there are also other differences in uh, these T cells, like for example, from a metabolic standpoint, and uh, we run a CRS experiment uh, to understand what is the uh, metabolism of uh, these T cells. And uh, when you look at uh, early tilts versus late tilts, you realize that uh, there is a decrease in both the oxygen consumption rate and uh, the production of the um, LDH, etc. That means that both the glycolysis and the um, uh, Krebs cycles uh, tend to be impaired uh, over time. And when you look at the same cells that uh, were uh, subjected to this kind of experiment, so same identical cells, same batch of cells, uh, you realize that uh, that kind of uh, metabolic reprogramming cannot be due to differences in uh, the differentiation uh, states. Last point, what is the exhaustion status of uh, TILs isolated from uh, pan-net uh, liver metastasis? Um, at the, like, when you look at day zero, uh, you find out that the expression of uh, uh, PD1, CD39, digit T3, and uh, CTLA4 is quite low in uh, CD4 positive T cells, uh, a little bit higher in uh, CD8 positive T cells. And then over time in culture, you have uh, an increase of uh, uh, immune uh, checkpoints, uh, in particular uh, CD39 and uh, TGIT and uh, uh, T3, whereas uh, uh, the expression of PD1 and CTLA4 tends to remain quite low. So to conclude, 
TILS can be successfully expanded from panatal liver metastasis to reach clinically meaningful numbers with a success rate in our hands of approximately 45%. Much better when you use fresh tumors rather than uh, cryopreserved tumors. So much better with microcultures versus tumor digests. Uh, much better with uh, interleukin-2 versus interleukin-715. Uh, the loss of HLA-2 implies that CD4 positive T cells will not be able to recognize tumor cells, uh, but watch out because CD4 T cells are prevalent in our arterial cultures. There is for sure a huge inter-individual, in, intra-individual and intralesional variability, um, and the TILS expanded from panate liver metastasis uh, have a high level of expression of TGIT and uh, uh, CD39, and we are eager to explore uh, these uh, immune checkpoints uh, to see if uh, combining um, uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors against this immune checkpoint Chunk points and our tilts, uh, we can get some results. With that, uh, I would like to thank you all for your attention. I would like to uh, uh, thanks uh, to thank all the, uh, the people in uh, our group uh, that uh, um, made this possible. In particular, uh, Nada Shaul. Uh, I would like to thank all our collaborators and, of course, all uh, our founders. Thank you very much. I think we'll have to forego questions here, but we can, if you have any, we can save them for the discussion at the end. And I'll uh, introduce our, our next speaker, which is um, Dr. Zi Chang Wang, um, who's coming to us from Rutgers University and is going to talk about the B7X uh, signaling pathway in uh, neuro, neuroendocrine tumors. So, thank you, introduction. Uh, today, I will update our the B7X project. This project is also funded by the that research foundation. So the B7 families is the major immune checkpoint in the regulator T cell activation and function. We have uh, discovered two new uh, B7F family. One is the B7X, another is the HA2, uh, which are may involving in the enhanced cancer development and progression by inhibiting T cell uh, immunofunctions. So HA2 is only in the humans, not in the mouse. So using our the human tissue band, we demonstrate B7X is uh, expressed in the 60% of the PNS. In the uh, grade one, uh, in the stage one is uh, 54% and stage uh, two is uh, 57% in stage four. Stage three is uh, 75% and stage four is 100%. We also demonstrate uh, B7X uh, articulation is the correlation with the tumor size and the uh, KI67. We can see in the panel A, uh, B7X is always present in the human peanut tissue, but not in the normal pancreatic tissue. In panel B, we can see the B7X is always present in correlation with the tumor size and KI67. In our the MEM knockout mice, we also demonstrate that B7X uh, is uh, always best in the, our the, uh, minimum knockout mice in the peanut tissue. So we also generate uh, MEM1 uh, and B7X double knockout mice. And by using uh, MEM1 single knockout mice and uh, uh, B7X single knockout mice, in panel A, we demonstrate insulin, a uh, tumor biomarker of the insuloma is a significant decrease in the MEM1 B7X double knockout mice compared to MEM1 single knockout mice. In panel B, we can see the, uh, the tumor is much smaller in the MEM1 B7X double knockout mice compared to MEM1 single knockout mice. So use the pro assay, we also demonstrate uh, T cell infiltration and N N NK cell and dense cell population in the MEM1 B7S double knockout mice uh, compared as MEM1 single knockout mice. So we also generate the B7S uh, antibody. We use this antibody to treat the mice with the peanut tumor. We, we can see the insulin is a significant decrease in the uh, B7 is uh, antibody treatment mice to compare the IgG control mice and also improves the survival in the B7 is uh, antibody treatment group. And tumor is much smaller in the B7 is antibody treatment group compared to the IgG control group. And we also 
from the T cell infiltration in the uh, B cell antibody treatment group compare the IgG control group. So we also investigate the what mechanism of the B cell upregulation in the P, in the tumor microenvironment of the PNS. We also demonstrate that uh, if one if alpha O expression is associated between the upregulation of the PNS in the tumor microenvironment of uh, MEM knockout mice, we can see when the tumor cell population, both in the HIF1 alpha and B cell is was upregulated in the tumor microenvironment of our MEM knockout mice. So use the mouse uh, beta cell model, we also demonstrate that HIF1 alpha regulated the B cell is upregulation up under the hypothesis condition. In panel A, uh, we can see the uh, cell culture in the hypothesis condition. Uh, both HIF1 alpha and B7 is upregulation. And when we treat the uh, cell line with the HIF1 alpha XRNA under hypothesis condition, uh, both uh, HIF1 alpha and B7 is lesser. And in the panel C, we use the B7X uh, promoter loss of assay. We can see the B7X uh, transgression is uh, increased. And we also demonstrate that. Uh, HIF1 alpha can bind to the B7X promoter uh, in the M134 beta cell under hypothesis condition and the MEM1 tumor tissue uh, from our the MEM knockout mouse. So use a single cell RNA seq we also demonstrate some normal uh, in, uh, NK immunotrepone protein also expressed in the NK cell of the uh, human peanut tissue. So in the human peanut tissue, so not only have a, a regulation of a T cell based immune support, also uh, NK based immune support, also O expression in our the human peanut tissue. So next step, maybe we also focus in the NK cell immune support protein expression, the, the function. So use a single cell TCR6, we also demonstrate some of the epitol in, uh, in our human peanut tissue. We found the, the epitol is different between the non-MEM1 tumor tissue and the uh, MEM1 tissues. So in the MEM1 tumor tissue, the epitol is much uh, unit and also high percentage in the T cell. So next step, uh, we will focus the MEM1 uh, uh, tumor tissue because it's more easy by the tumor um, antigen because uh, non amine tumor tissue, the epitol is uh, very diversified. It's not e easy to find the um, uh, tumor antigen. So we summarize. b 7 is is a regulation in the human and mouse peanut tissue peanut tumors, and is a significant uh, correlation with the clinical and pathological catalyze. Loss of the B7X in the B7X and MEM1 double knockout mites, so the decrease the beta cell in perforation and tumor transformation by increased T cell infiltration. Target B7X with the B7X antibody promotes in the anti tumor response mediums by increased T cell infiltration in our preclinical setting. We believe that target B7 is may offer an attractive strategy for the immunotherapy of the patient of the penis. So next step, we will continue uh, uh, in investigate the expression and the role of the identified T cell and NK cell immunotropon uh, in the, our human and mouse penis tissues. And also, we will continue to identify uh, specific tumor antigen of uh, penis and develop novel engineered T cell and uh, some uh, cancer vaccine. So we also have a, a cooperation with uh, uh, some company, it's a next immunity company to, to engineer T cell for target P7X. And also uh, cancer vaccine, MR vaccine is very successful in the infection disease. And uh, a couple months ago, and uh, 
Moderna's uh, lungs is a very successful the phase two the mRNA vaccine in the melanoma. And next step, we will uh, uh, thinking about we use the uh, mRNA uh, vaccine platform to uh, uh, combine our the tumor antigen to uh, try some the uh, make some the vaccine and make the turn the cold tumor into the a hot tumor and improve our immunotherapy. So, okay, don't move. So I, I don't know. I cannot move. So, and this project is supported by the New Endocrine Research Foundation, and um, I happy to answer any question. All right, I think we have time for one question if there if there is one. Um. Hi, uh, uh, very nice talk. Um, in your mouse model, uh, maybe I've missed it, but if you start treatment when you have an advanced uh, tumor, because I, I think the treatment started early, but if you start at a very late stage when this yeah. tumor is already formed and advanced, uh, do you see regression of the tumor? Uh, the tumor we treat from the 12 months, and um, is uh, we can see it's uh, very good, uh, successful for the uh, efficacy. And the next step, we will want to treat the early age, and uh, maybe six months. Uh, because of our mouse model, uh, at the six months they develop hyperplasia. I want to see how about the change hyperplasia to tumor transformation. And also, we also have another mouse model for the um, P P10 MEM knockout mouse model, double knockout mouse model. This mouse model can develop the liver metastasis and the lymph node metastasis. We also want to use this antibody to treat that and see they can um, prevent the uh, newer metastasis uh, or uh, treat uh, uh, newer metastasis, yeah. All right, great, thank you. All right, thank you very much. All right, uh, next we're going to welcome to the stage um, Dawn Kell from the University of Iowa. Um, she'll be speaking about therapies targeting CDK4 and 6, uh, MEK, cause regression, immune cell activation, and sensitization to pdl one immunotherapy in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Okay, thank you, everybody. It's great to see such a great turnout and uh, to hear all the fantastic talks at this symposium. So. I'd like to tell you a little bit about our work where we're trying to sensitize the tumors to PDL1 therapy, and this is for pancreatic nets. And so we all know these are clinically challenging tumors. Uh, they're slow growing. They uh, are not sensitive to most traditional therapies, and they don't respond well to immune checkpoint inhibitor therapies when given as monotherapies. So, and we all know we need to learn more about the biology of the tumors. And my lab is really quite focused on studying the biology of pancreatic nets and how we can improve treatments for them. So the current therapies that we uh, give to these patients include those targeting the somatostatin receptors, AKT mTOR signaling, uh, receptor tyrosine kinases like VEGF receptor, but once patients uh, who have unresectable disease uh, become resistant to those therapies, they really do not have uh, other good options. And so that's where we need to come up with better combination therapies uh, or different targets and different treatments that would effectively eradicate these treatment-resistant tumors. So this cartoon on the left is very busy, but it highlights many different dysregulated pathways that we have already identified within pancreatic nets. And our group is focused on a couple of the centrally activated pathways, the cyclin-dependent kinase 4 or CDK4-6 and the MEK kinases. And the reasons that we're interested in them include the fact that others Laura Tang's group long ago had demonstrated that these tumors overexpress CDK4 and 6. 
uh, there is a loss of the inhibitor of these kinases called P16, and that is correlated with worse survival. Um, we see upregulation of factors that turn on CDK4 and 6, and that includes the MEK kinase, which is upstream of it. And we performed kinome studies in PNET cells and found that CDK6 is hyperactive in growing PNET cells compared to non-growing cells. And phosphoproteome, global phosphoproteome analyses also revealed that CDK4, 6, and MEK kinase pathways are hyperactivated in the growing PNET cells. We also know that there's rapid resistance if uh, these cells, or in some cases in clinical trials, patients are treated with CDK4 inhibitors. And that's when given as monotherapy. So what we have hypothesized is that if we can target two of these key players together in a combination therapy against CDK4, 6, and MEK, that we would have synergistic uh, effects that would uh, reduce and hopefully keep the tumors at bay. And this is based a lot on some seminal papers that came out a few years ago in Science and Cell from the uh, Scott Lowe's group, which really demonstrated that if you use CDK4-6 inhibitors like palbociclib that directly bind and inhibit the kinase, and you combine them with MEK inhibitors, which act upstream, uh, like mirtametinib or trametinib, that will inhibit the expression of CDK4-6. And so together, you synergistically reactivate the retinoblastoma tumor suppressor. That will promote tumor cell senescence, and that will lead to an infiltration of activated immune cells and promote anti-tumor immunity. So we, we tested this in vitro first using Bond and QGP1 cells, and you can see that in the combination, which is in the red bar, that you have much more significant cell cycle arrest compared to the single drugs that are in the, the two intermediate bars. You also have significantly more cell death induced by the combination, and that correlated at the molecular level with reactivation of the RB tumor suppressor, which is shown by its reduced phosphorylation. So we moved that combination in vivo, and we started with Bon1 xenografts. And you can see in the red curve that you get significant extension and survival of these mice for months if you give them this therapy every day. It's an oral uh, combination therapy. But you never see a regression of the tumors. So you just see kind of a flat line. And when we took away the drugs at that point where you see a blue line coming up, some of the mice we didn't give any treatment to again in the blue line, and the tumors came back quickly. And in the red line, the tumors also all came back. So eventually, all those tumors will become resistant. And I'll point out, again, these are xenografts in uh, immune-deficient mice. So we wanted to get into immune-competent setting. And you just heard from Xi Zhang from Rutgers, and we reached out to him and Steve Labuti because they have a MEN1 P10 double knockout mouse that develops insulinomas by five to six months of age. And in those tumors, there's very elevated levels of CDK4-6, one of our targets. And we predicted that if we had this combination therapy shown in the combo mouse on the lower right, that we would have the best effect at causing tumor regression, not just tumor suppression and preventing increased growth, but actually causing it to regress. And that was actually the case. So in these immune-competent mice, when we treat with the combination, uh, in that panel on the lower right for the IHC, you can see that the tumors are much smaller. The KI67 is significantly reduced. And we were very delighted by this. And we predicted that this regression was going to be associated with immune cell activation. So uh, at Rutgers, they looked at the immune composition of the tumors by flow cytometric analyses. And you can see that the key differences between the vehicle control and the combination shown in red is that uh, we had increased CD19 positive B cells and plasma cells in the tumors that were regressing. We also saw increased uh, antigen-presenting dendritic cells. There were trends for increases in the T cells, but it was not dramatic at all. So we were excited by this because in other tumor types, 
uh, it's been shown that there's this great correlation in association studies between increased B and plasma cells in tumors with better patient survival. Also, if you have more B and plasma cells in a patient tumor, that correlates with increased formation of tertiary lymphoid structures, which are like lymph nodes within the tumors, and that helps protect the tumor. And those, those structures have B cells, T cells, dendritic cells, and that all helps to fight off the, the tumor. Also, B and plasma cells within tumors increase the efficacy of immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy, or at least the association studies suggested that they would. And so we predicted that if we inhibited CDK4 and 6, that we would then sensitize the tumors to immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy. And we specifically hypothesized that this would work very well if we combined it with PDL1 targeted therapy. And the reason we focused on PDL1 is because CDK4-6 inhibition is known to cause upregulation of PDL1 in breast cancer and other types of tumors. MEC is kind of unclear what it's doing, but if you have more of a target, PDL1, then the antibodies that target it should be more effective and hopefully unleash a better immune attack against the tumors. So with this study, Zhi Zhang ran this. He treated the, the tumors for four weeks. And you can see in the blue line on the left, on the left side graph that uh, there's significantly less insulin production during that time course which is indicative of smaller tumors. And on the right-hand side, the actual tumor size is greatly decreased with the combination of CDK4-6 inhibitor and PD-L1 antibody compared to the individual drugs alone, which are shown in the gray and red bars. So to conclude this part, we've shown that CDK4-6 met inhibition will synergistically uh, suppress PNETs, both in vitro and in vivo. Uh, oops, and, and that the, the inhibition will lead to immune activation in the immune competent MEN1 P10 double knockout mice, and that the inhibition sensitizes the PNETs to PDL1 targeted therapy. Our future studies are to really test what's the importance of those B cells and plasma cells. Are they really uh, necessary for improved response to therapy? And we're working on that, uh, but I want to show you some data from a sarcoma model that we have of an aggressive uh, malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor model, where you can see in wild-type mice, if you treat with just CDK4-6 and MEK inhibitors in the blue bar, there's significant regression of the tumors, because that's what we're measuring in the graph. If you now add in the pdl one antibody, you see even longer regression of those tumors, and in fact, 10% of the mice are cured when we treat them. So that was fantastic. Um, if we do this study in animals that lack plasma cells, so these are AID mu S double knockout mice, they uh, do not demonstrate this sensitization to PDL1. So they respond to the CDK4-6 inhibitors, but they do not respond to PDL1 or immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy. So we're real excited by this. We think this is very important for our understanding and potentially in predicting which patients are going to be responsive to immune checkpoint inhibitors therapies. Um, we have a lot of other studies that we want to do. I won't run through, but we do want to examine the immune uh, landscape of the tumors that we're treating with PDL1 combination therapies. We also want to begin a clinical trial. And as part of our group at the University of Iowa, we're, we're trying to uh, gather 16 PNET patients who uh, have metastatic um, accessible primary tumors that are amenable to biopsy and who are candidates for surgical resection. We want to treat them for three weeks with CDK4-6 inhibitor, palbociclib, and then we want to give them two doses of the immune checkpoint inhibitor antibody. Uh, we want to compare then biopsies before treatment with surgical resected tumors after treatment. And we want to look at the immune composition and see, does this therapy truly induce an immune activation response? This would be a good uh, justification for moving this into uh, phase two trials. So we're very excited. I couldn't do any of this without the people in my lab, the two people in particular who did this work were Courtney and Salma. 
Um, the uh, Iowa Net Spore Group is is very robust, and uh, I couldn't really ask the right questions clin at the basic level without their clinical guidance. Um, I do want to point out our collaborators at Rutgers, shown in pink. Uh, we began this collaboration based on a meeting that we had here at NetRF, and so just getting together and hearing what other people are doing is very stimulating for meaningful interactions. Also, I've highlighted um, Mina Kim and her, her group uh, at Columbia from last year. We got together. I didn't show the data, but she has analyzed the tumors that uh, Zhi Zhang has treated with our, with our combination. And there actually is a reduction in, in tumor vascular density uh, with this combination of CDK4 MEK inhibitors. So we're learning a lot more. And thanks to NetRF, we're, we're beginning some really meaningful collaborations. Oops. And I'll leave it there and welcome questions. So we probably have time for a question here. So this one. Don, that was great. I just had a question on the durability. So I was struck at the beginning by, you know, come, things come back. Do you have any sense of how durable this response is going to be? Um, yeah, I think that the CDK4 MEK inhibitor combination, while it will be good for a little bit, I don't think it's going to be sustained. And so that's why we really moved to adding the immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy. And at least in our sarcoma studies, which are really well powered, um, we are seeing uh, 10 to 15 percent is completely sustained, even if we remove the treatment after maybe 100 days. Um, and then for another group, they respond really well, but those tumors will eventually come back. And we don't know why, but we want to investigate that. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Up next, we have Eleonora Pell from Moffitt, and she's going to be talking to us about a bispecific T-cell engager targeting SSTR. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to share my research. And as you know, I'm working on the development of a novel anti-somatostatin receptor by specific T-cell engager-like molecule for the treatment of uh, neuroendocrine tumors. Okay. A bit of background, as you all know very well, uh, well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors are characterized by the overexpression of the somatostatin receptor. And also, as you well know, uh, immunotherapy with, uh, let's say, um, traditional immune checkpoint inhibitors such as anti-PD-1, anti-PD-1 failed in the treatment of this group of patients. However, we have seen today in the previous talks, and also we know from the literature that there is actually T-cell infiltration in these tumors. So perhaps to efficiently elicit this immune response, we might need to explore new approaches. So let me talk a little bit about bispecific T-cell engagers. Uh, so these are molecules that are, um, let me see how can I point. Yeah, that are composed of two domains one directed against a T-cell express molecule, uh, which is usually the CD3, can be another one, and the other domain directed against a tumor-associated antigen. So what these molecule, uh, molecules do, it's basically uh, connect, physically connect the T-cells and the tumor cells and create the so-called immunological synapses. So if this binding is strong enough, we will have the activation of the T-cells against the tumor cells with the release of uh, granules, most of the time granzyme B or perforin, and eventually the killing of the target cells. So we decided to adapt this approach uh, at neuroendocrine tumors and try to develop a molecule that is targeting the um, somatostatin receptor. So, and this is the design of our molecule. As you can see here, it's quite different uh, than the uh, bite that I've just um, uh, described. That's because these are, uh, um, my, the, our molecule is characterized, is composed actually of uh, two molecules of somatostatin-14, which is the hormone that physiologically binds the somatostatin receptor on the tumor-associated antigen portion, let's say. And then the um, T-cells targeting portion is uh, composed of a FCSV, so the classical way um, antibody directed against the CD3. 
So we are doing so uh, because we we hope that we can have a double effect. So we can um, potentially have the T cell activation through the mechanism that I earlier described. So release of cellulitic granules, activation of T cells, uh, net cell death. And also, perhaps, we can preserve this uh, anti-proliferative signaling, anti-secretive signaling that is characteristic of the somatostatin, res the, um, somatostatin 14. So our project is divided in three big parts. The first one was the actual design of the molecule. Uh, and then a second part is basically the um, in vivo assessment of the activity. And then the third part is the uh, in vivo validation of our results. So in this talk, I'm just going to describe the first and the second uh, part. So this is a summary, a very short summary of the first part. So we screened actually several constructs and all of them went through this process. So we started uh, designing the sequence, writing the sequence, and then we cloned the, the, the optimized codon inside a vector that we used to produce baculovirus. This specific virus is used to infect insect cells that are a great, uh, that are a great system to produce uh, protein. So we went through this uh, process. We, for all the protein that, that we screened, we produced the baculovirus and then we infected the, the uh, insect cells. We collected the supernatant and then we isolated the protein through nickel uh, and then analyzed through size sculpture and chromatography. And then after that, we purified again the protein and we checked our results. So I am showing you here on the right uh, the results of the one that we that we found it was successful and we used in the future studies. Um, so here you can see that the peak is very clear. We have our protein and then on the gel, the molecular wave is uh, the expected one. We didn't find any dimer or anything else other than our protein. So then we move to the in vitro um, characterization. So here, the in vitro characterization is divided in three parts. So the in the first part, we try to describe the relationship between the T cells and our molecule. And then in the second part, uh, we actually checked in which capacity these T cells was able to activate the T cells. And then in the third part, we focused on uh, cytotoxicity. So uh, we first thing we ran a flow to titrate our molecule. And as you can see here, we co incubated, oops, sorry. We co incubated. Um, our molecule, the bite, an antibody, which is an antimic, which will uh, bind the molecule and T cells from health, isolated from healthy donor. And after incubation, we basically just checked how much antibody was binding our T cells. And as you can see here, we found a very nice titration curve where uh, we found that a hundred nanomolar uh, bite uh, bound uh, more than 80% of our cells. And those were both uh, CD8 cells and CD4 cells. And then we moved to the T cell activation. And then as you can see here, oops, sorry. As you can see here, uh, we co-incubated, uh, again, T cells from LT donor in the presence of the bite. We target cells, which are in this case 293T transduced to express a fusion protein, which is somatostatin receptor 2 and GFP. So um, after incubation, we measured the uh, cytokine secretion. And then as you can see here, after incubation of T cells with um, somatostatin receptor positive cells in presence of our bite, we had a significantly um, higher uh, interferon gamma production compared to the preparation without the, the bite or in absence of the somatostatin receptor. And we also explored the production of granzyme B that, as I was mentioning earlier, is one of the most important mechanisms in the immunological synapses. And also here, we confirmed our results. And this was done at the optimal, let's say, concentration, meaning 100 nanomolar bite. And then 
we decided to explore a little bit a uh, different concentration. So we decided to move to 20 nanomolar byte, which is way less than the optimal. And here, as you can see, we had 60% of uh, T cells uh, bound. And again, here, uh, this is the graph that I showed you before. I just bring it here to compare it with the 20 nanomolar concentration. We found the, the same result. And then this is a preliminary experiment on cell toxicity that we just ran. So we, again, uh, incubated the, the T cells with our somatostatin receptor positive cells. And as you can see here, we measure the cell count. So basically, this is the growth cur curve of the cells, uh, growth with media only, and these uh, dotted yellow line is T cells only. And then it's pretty clear that after um, adding our byte first and then byte plus T cells, we had a significantly, uh, a significant uh, cell toxicity and reduction of the cell count. And then uh, these are the future directions. We want to validate first this uh, first mm, uh, set round of experiment, in vitro experiment in uh, net cells line, because as I mentioned, we wanted a very clean uh, system here. So we decided to have um, 293T transduced cells, but we will validate this. And then we hopefully will move forward to the in, um, in vivo experiment where we, where we will use NSG mice xenograft and that will be treated with PBS only, of course, as a control, T cells only as control, the uh, T cell engager by itself and the combination of the two. So as a conclusion, we designed a novel by specific T cell engager that has a specific activation of T cells in vitro involving CD3 signaling. Um, and that um, the C3 signaling activation goes through the somatostatin receptor recognition. And I want to point out that this was that mediated by a peptide, meaning that a peptide with its binding affinity is good enough to elicit an uh, immune synapsis activation. And thank you so much. Let me thank my mentor, Dr. Jonathan Strasberg, my former mentor, Mauro Chives, and also all our collaborators uh, in the immunology, immunology department at Moffitt. We have Daniela Barreraga and um, Patrick Hu. And then also uh, a great support for this uh, study was Vincent Luca, uh, Drug Discovery, and in our um, institution that also uh, took care and helped a lot with the protein production. Thank you very much. All right. Do we have any questions for Eleonora? Protein as a, as a molecule because we know, I think, from the development of somatostatin analogs that somatostatin, stable somatostatin analogs were developed because of stability. And somatostatin 14 has a circulating half-life of few minutes. So have you thought about that? Yes, actually, that's a great question. We have been uh, thinking about that. So. Um, as I showed earlier, this is not somatostatin by itself, but is a bigger uh, molecule and has, I mean, I didn't show it here, but has some sequencing that stabilizes the, the shape of the protein. Uh, plus, uh, we think that the enzyme that cleaves the somatostatin has a hard time, let's say, to approach a somatostatin when it's binded to a bigger protein, like in this case. So we so far uh, don't think that, I mean, at least so far this is working and is stable for longer than a few minutes, and we think it's, that's the reason. But uh, we also consider on uh, using um, other molecules that also target some uh, receptor, um, which are similar to octreotide or similar to some venom that actually uh, present in the nature that are not um, attacked, let's say, by enzymes. But that's a great point. We think we overcame this problem this way. And also, there is another thing. Uh, as soon as the molecule binds the T cells, 
through the CD3 domain, then uh, its half life is way longer than somatostatin free. Okay, thank you. Great work, thank you. Um, on the CD3 front, I wanted to find if uh, you or your team explored different CD3 binders, uh, you know, weak, medium, and strong binders to tune it to the other side. So just for the CD3 part? Correct. Yeah, no, we did not because we started with this um, uh, sequence, uh, which is pretty similar to the blinatumumab one. So we didn't explore other binding affinity, but I see actually that's a great point because we know that changing the binding affinity of both domain, we can have actually a different effect. So our goal so far was to actually prove that a peptide had a binding affinity, which was strong enough to elicit this effect. And then perhaps after refining that, we can work on the CD3 part to have the uh, less uh, a specific activation, let's say that possible. So yeah, it's in the future uh, direction for sure. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. So um, I'd actually like to invite all the speakers from this session to come up to the stage um, so that we're ready for our discussion after our final talk. Um, so our final speaker will be Kevin McHugh um, from Rice University, who will be speaking about mutation-targeted immunotherapy in atypical pulmonary carcinoids using CRISPR-Cas. All right. Thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, thank you to the organizers for giving me an opportunity uh, to speak about the work that we're doing under a pilot award that we received from NetRF. Um, I do have no um, financial disclosures that are relevant here, but I have a couple other ones. One, I'm relatively new to the net space, uh, so I learned a lot of it this last couple of days. And then second, I'm an engineer, so uh, maybe we have a little bit different way of thinking about things. We have a very reductionist approach uh, to dealing with um, not only uh, atypical pulmonary carcinoids, but also other uh, nets potentially. How do I move this forward? That's right. Oh, that's not it. Oh, the big one at the top. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, yeah. So as we've heard today, you know, we don't have this kind of silver bullet mutation that we can target. Uh, however, all these uh, nets are going to have some mutations, right? The mutations are not the same. Uh, there's differences between tumor types. There's differences. Uh, between patients and there's differences within a patient, right? So that makes this really hard. Uh, however, you know, we do have the opportunity to find mutations somewhere. So it's not the same one, but it could, there are, they are there. Um, and so the problem with targeting these in general is that we don't usually have a unique target if we use something like a small molecule or, um, uh, or even an antibody. And these are really difficult to make, right? So the unmutated proteins can be very similar or there's an overexpression thing, things like this. It's not going to be very specific. So we want to have something that's a little bit more specific than that. And so what we're doing is trying to treat the upstream cause, the actual DNA mutation itself. And we're doing that with CRISPR-Cas9. I'll explain a little bit about how that works and why that's nice because we can easily customize the components and also have a discrete target, right? So we have one base there instead of a different base, for example. Uh, so just a little background in CRISPR. So very important, right? Won the Nobel Prize in chemistry, of course, because chemistry prize is never given to chemists. Uh, so very important technology, and so uh, if you're not familiar with it, you know what, how it works is basically there's this Cas9 enzyme, and when you have a guide RNA, it defines a particular sequence. So about three bases, depending on which Cas9 you're talking about, uh, come from the Cas9 enzyme, and another 20 bases or so are defined by this guide RNA. And so the idea is that you can make a precise cut based on that sequence, and then you can fill that cut with DNA of your choice, so a particular gene that you might want. And so very exciting, just yesterday, first CRISPR therapy approved. So this is happening in people by the UK. Uh, probably my guess is that it'll be approved by the FDA uh, shortly thereafter. So very good time to be around. And you know, we went from the discovery about a dozen years ago to a clinical therapy. So pretty impressive at the speed there. Um, and so there's a couple you know, outcomes from CRISPR genome editing. So of course we want one thing, which is to put in whatever gene we want in our particular, light, uh, particular spot with a precise edit. However, there's other things that can happen, right? So once you make this cut, it can just seal up and you have the same wild type sequence that you had before. You can insert a base randomly or a few bases randomly. You can delete a base randomly um, or you can have some frame shift, right? So we want this one in general if we're gonna make a precise edit, although maybe some of these will still be useful as I'll show you in the next slides. And so it's not realistic to think that we can fix all the mutations that are there. We don't even know what all the mutations that are there. This is not an efficient process. 
And therefore, instead of trying to fix them, we just want to kill cells that have the mutations that we find and identify in our nets. Um, and so there, this is not uh, a brand new idea. There's a couple of papers that have demonstrated nice utility in preclinical models. So one targeted this LA58R mutation in EGFR in a lung cancer model. And so what they did is basically have a wild type sequence that did not have a PAM site. So a PAM site or protospacer adjacent motif is this three nucleotides that are defined by the Cas9 you're using. And then when the mutant, uh, because of a single nucleotide substitution in the mutant, it does have this PAM site, this NGG PAM site that's associated with uh, SP Cas9. And so what they showed is that they could specifically um, edit cells based on the presence of this PAM site in the mutant and not edit the normal cells. And they also show that that reduced the tumor growth in a model. And so in this case, all they're doing is creating this insertion and deletion. Okay, so as I showed in the last slide, we can have a couple outcomes. They didn't even put a gene. They don't want to put a gene in there. All they want to do is delete a base or add a base randomly to have a frame shift and then basically truncate the uh, utility of the, of the gene. Okay. So another um, study showed that they can do this with the gene fusion event. In this case, they're in prostate cancer. And so the idea is that these two genes are normally far apart. They move together. And so now you have kind of a unique sequence here that's not supposed to be next to each other. And so you can uh, design a sequence that uses, in this case, they use these two NIC aces and these guide RNAs. And so they made a specific edit in here, which allowed them to get specificity for cutting the uh, mutant sequence, right? And so if you have a couple, it, this takes a couple of pieces. I know this is kind of complicated, but basically they make the cut, they induce this, or they put in this gene. This gene encodes an inducible suicide gene. When they add a small molecule, then they get tumor uh, regression instead of tumor growth when all those components are present. Uh, and that results in, in their case, 100% survival instead of 100% death out of 60 days. So these were pretty exciting for us. Um, unfortunately, they're a little bit rigged to the favor of this approach. Um, so they or were looking at a mutation in the first case that has this NGG that's emergent from, that's specifically targeted by SPCAS9. So that's only about 4% of all mutations. Uh, the second paper looked at fusion genes, which are even rarer. So uh, these are, you know, it'd be great to cure 5% of the patients, absolutely. But in most cases, we're not going to be so lucky to have these particular uh, mutations. And so in addition, uh, the indel formation of the paper, for, the first paper was not cured, it only slowed growth. Uh, and then the inducible donor had an issue with weekly dosing. So again, this is a little bit in the weeds, uh, but the idea is that this is delivered everywhere. And since it has a plasmid with a, it's a plasmid with a promoter, it can be transcribed and translated in cells. So you need to wait for that to wash out before you can actually give the small molecule to induce cell death only in the cells that you want. Um, and so additionally, in vivo editing remains a huge challenge. So maybe we could get 1% of cells edited. That's not very many. So how many times do we have to dose, especially if we're only getting 1%? each time and we can only dose every week. So these are some of the challenges that we uh, are trying to eliminate in our system. Um, so again, initially we use the, or they use that uh, PAM targeting system that only can address 4% of the mutations. We are expanding out to these other Cas9 variants. So these are either engineered or found in other species and they have different PAM specificity. So instead of NGG, they can target um, uh, say AGA. And so that increases our potential targeted library from about 4% of mutations to 49% of mutations. Uh, we're also implementing a gene trap, and I'll show you a little bit more about what that means, but the idea is that we can just dose it really frequently because we don't have to wait for that washout period. And then we're using a suicide gene that induces immunogenic cell death with the idea that we're not going to be able to edit every single cell and, cell and directly kill it. We're going to want to kill a small percentage of them and then have a secondary immune response that mops up the rest of the non-dead cells. And so in summary, what we're doing here is taking a guide RNA and Cas9 and combining it with a donor DNA, co-delivering those. They're gonna go into normal cells and to the nets, net cells, uh, but if they go into a healthy cell or a normal cell, they're not gonna recognize the mutated sequence, they're not gonna cut, they're not gonna insert, and your cell stays unharmed and unedited. However, if it goes into a net cell, then you're gonna have the cutting happening, you're gonna have your donor DNA inserted, you're gonna induce this um, you know, immunogenic cell death, and then you're gonna have dendritic cells pick up those neoantigens, train T cells, et cetera. And so in the long term, we imagine the clinical therapy looking something like this. You biopsy the tumor, right? So this is already done. Sequence cells, we can already do this. Uh, prepare formulations. So now that we've identified the mutations, we can pick the particular guide RNA, Cas9 variant, and then add these homology arms to our donor DNA. Uh, and then we can administer these formulations and then have this secondary immune response that can, um, again, kill the rest of the cells that you aren't able to directly um, transfect. And so uh, a couple of things about this. So we want to have the mutation in the PAM instead of the guide, right? So the guide is the easy way to do this, but the not specific way to do this. If you have a single nucleotide substitution, it's not going to be specific enough. And that's what we show here in our data. So if you have just guide RNA-based editing, this is a GFP-BFP 
uh, model where there's one nucleotide difference. Um, and so if you target with the guide RNA, it cuts the one nucleotide different one still at a huge percentage. But if you target with the PAM site, the PAMs are not tolerant to these mismatches. And so you get no cutting instead of high cutting. And so there are a bunch of these different natural engineered Cas9s that I mentioned. Here's the different versions or the most popular 17 or so of them, uh, and the PAM sequences that they cut. So this is really expanding our library and we can reproduce or we can produce these recombinantly in order to and show that they are uh, able to edit the correct sequence. Um, so we sequenced these NCIH720 cells for different mutations. Uh, I have some cute highlighted in he here in green. Uh, really what we need to do in terms of criteria, so we can't select every mutation. And I know that low mutational burden is a problem in some cases, uh, but there's some advantages, like we can use silent mutations, that's fine. Those probably won't be the best ones. We prefer the, ca the two, uh, cancer drivers because that will allow us to um, have more, I guess, homogeneity throughout the sample, or those will be the truncal mutations. Um, and so we also want to, I think, target these um, gain of function or oncogenes rather than tumor suppressors because two reasons which I think are temporary um, as we continue to evolve better or use directed protein engineering to make better Cas9s uh, because we don't want to do two, we don't want to edit a healthy cell accidentally, right, in a tumor suppressor gene because then we could potentially induce the exact problem we want to solve. Uh, so if we aim for a uh, oncogene, then if we edit a healthy cell, we'll only provide that a selective disadvantage instead of causing cancer in its own right. Uh, and then uh, for NETS, indels will also be a partial success. So even if we get an insertion or deletion, it will kind of hamstring that cancer cell rather than um, causing an issue. Uh, so we have developed this gene trap. Again, our system has no selectivity. We're not making a nanoparticle with an antibody on it at the internalization stage. So it's going to go into both normal cells and NET cells. Uh, and we don't want to express the suicide gene inside there. And so the idea is that we can, instead of having a, a promoter on the plasma, we could borrow the promoter from the donor, uh, from the endogenous gene. Um, and so if you were normally going to make one of these things, you would just put your own promoter there. But then when you get the plasma inside the cell, it's going to start producing the protein. And that's obviously bad if it's a cytotoxic protein and it goes into all the cells. So we make the promoterless version where we can use a self-cleaving peptide and no promoter. And then once it gets inserted, it uses whatever gene you put it into make the actual full um, the construct. Uh, and so here's our gene trap data. So we have no transfection. Obviously, none of these have GFP inside them. Uh, and then we can have the promoter version of the plasma. This, this would be the normal one for the donor. Again, oh, this doesn't have any Cas9. So we're not editing the cells. We're just putting it in there and seeing what happens. Um, and then if we use this gene trap system, then we get no expression as we thought because there's no promoter on the plasmid. And our, guide, uh, our um, flow data backs this up. Um, and so we also want to optimize transfection efficiency. This, this sets kind of like the upper limit for how much trans, uh, delivery we can get or how much editing we can get. So it's really important that we maximize this. Um, and so we used just mCherry to look at transfection methods. And so we screened a bunch of different protocols and a bunch of different materials. And uh, we've increased the, the transfection efficiency in vitro up to 11.2%. Uh, we probably can go a little bit farther still. Uh, so just to summarize what we did, uh, we demonstrated the specificity of our PAM-based targeting as opposed to guide RNA-based targeting. We created a gene trap that prevented uh, pre-insertion, pre-integration insertion, and we optimized our protocol for uh, transfection. And so the next kind of steps we have here are to create parallel cell lines uh, with bespoke mutations. So we can also use CRISPR to insert or delete a particular mutation that we might want to target. Um, so that would be really great if we had a cell line that was exactly identical except for a single base, and we could then attribute the uh, editing specificity to that one even more so than comparing different cell lines, for example. Uh, we want to produce and test these different ribonu uh, ribonuclear proteins. That's where you already have complexed the Cas9 with the guide RNA. And there's some advantages of that, namely that we can do multiplexing. So obviously, you know, mutation-based escape is a huge issue. Our, our tumor heterogeneity and mutational heterogeneity are issues. And so if we can dose, say, 10 different RMPs at the same time that target 10 different mutations, then we could be less likely to find cells that don't have any of those in there. Um, and then, of course, the big one here is to evaluate the specificity, efficiency, um, and the nature of the cell, cell death injections. We want to induce an immunogenic, uh, immunogenic cell death, and we can uh, evaluate that using flow, and we can look for different uh, markers of, of expression and release in inside the media. Um, we can also co-insert We can also co -insert, uh, different genes if we want to, like pathogen-associated molecular patterns, damage-associated molecular patterns, um, to improve the uh, immunogenicity of the cell death as well. Uh, so I just want to acknowledge uh, NetRF as well as the people who worked on this, my lab, uh, in particular, Tyler Graf um, and Sheng Yua uh, Piao have both worked on this a lot. Um, and with that, if there's any time, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you.
Any any questions specifically for for Kevin here? Otherwise, we can uh, have him join the rest of us here. Oh, we got got one in the bag. Uh, just a very quick question. I'm very curious. So, you when you deliver this complex, I guess you're going to inject it directly into the tumor site. Is this my understanding? Yeah, that's going to you know tip the scales a little bit in our favor as opposed to like an IV administration. Uh, so that would be better just to have a localization effect of having these in the right cells. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess that was the first concern. But when you inject the, any of these components in a tumor that it has stroma, macrophages, and it, and tumor cells, do we know which cells actually will preferentially take up your complex? Are like the maybe macrophages end up taking. 90% of it, do, do we know anything about this? Um, yeah, I think, there, I think there's some distribution of which cells will take it up just but yeah, because you're thinking like a macrophage is a phagocytic cell and so it's gonna grab nanoparticles. Yeah, I think that's definitely the case. I mean, when you administer you know, these types of nanoparticles um, systemically, you see a lot wind up in the liver, right? That's like how these things work. Uh, so I think it's just a, how many cells do you need to get it to? How many particles can you administer locally? So I think, you know, the environment has plenty of these of, of actual, you know, cancer net cells, right? So our atypical uh, carcinoids. So, so I think the question is how many, what percent do we actually need to edit to have the desired effect? And so if we can dose this frequently, I mean, I think the, the main thing that's going to be that could limit our dosing frequency is the toxicity of the carrier, right? And so that's a whole field of people trying to develop less toxic carriers. So I think what you're saying is correct. I think the idea is that if it goes into the macrophage, even preferentially, um, it doesn't really matter because it doesn't have the correct mutation to allow it to cut and insert its gene. Um, and I would say if you do happen to kill a uh, you know, tumor-resident macrophage, probably not the end of the world also. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. Is there time for one more question? Oh. Sure. Yeah, sure. Um, Shield Erks from Maastricht. Um, I was wondering, um, have you tested this technique already on organoids? Um, so there are several organoids models now available also for neuroendocrine tumors of the lung as well. Uh, we have not done that. I mean, happy, happy to talk about it more if, that, if that's uh, something that could be interesting to you or some tool that you have available. Yeah. So, uh, so Talia Dayton, uh, one of the researchers, she's in EMBL now. She has several of these models available to test it on the organoids. And I think it's very relevant because um, also with this cell line, so the A721, there are several papers that when you look at the genomic level, so the mutational level, it actually compares much better to small cell lung cancer mm -hmm. than actually that it's a carcinoid. It grows a bit too fast to be a carcinoid in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So it would be nice to, to, to collaborate there and to really see if this is effective in atypical carcinoids or typical carcinoids. Yeah, definitely be happy to talk more about that. I mean, that's exactly the purpose of me being here in the first place, right? Is to figure out what the best models are. Uh, it's pretty easy for us to customize it to a different mutation or set of mutations. So um, yeah, that sounds, yeah. sounds yeah. something fruitful. Thanks. Kevin, if you want to join us here at the the table and we'll open it up for um, any general questions for discussion about immunotherapies and nets here. I guess I can uh, kick us off. Uh, so I, I think that one of the one of the common themes and essentially every every discussion here is that we're dealing with, you know, relatively speaking, an immune cold tumor and trying to make it immune hot. Um, and I think each of us is using a little bit of a different proxy for this. Some of us are looking at T cell infiltration. Some of us are looking at actual response. Um, others looking at MHC expression. So I, I, I'm wondering if the group feels like there is one particular proxy that's the that, that that's the, the the one that we should all be using for whether or not we're successful in uh, stimulating the immune system here, um, or do you think it just it, it's just ultimately whether or not they respond to to immunotherapy? So if I can uh, comment on that, I think that uh, we cannot use just one proxy. I think that we need multiple proxies. Um, the antigen burden, um, that clearly is an epiphenomenon on, of mutational burden. Uh, but when we talk about neantigens, we always need to remember that uh, there is quantity of neantigens and quality of neantigens, and uh, that uh, can make the difference. Uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the binding affinity that uh, they show to the uh, TCR complex. Um, 
Obviously, then uh, you have HL expression versus uh, loss of the HL expression. And it was quite striking in our experience to see that uh, it's so high the frequency of the uh, HLA class 2 uh, loss. Um, and then, obviously, uh, I think that the third crucial parameter is the degree of T cell infiltration. And even more strikingly, the location of T cell infiltration. And I think that the, one of the most compelling questions that the, we need to answer uh, in general in uh, tumor immunology and in particular in, like for NETS in this case is, is there a reason for this spatial heterogeneity? Uh, is there a reason why T cells are distributed in different uh, locations uh, within a tumor? Um, I think it's not surprising that uh, uh, we commonly find them uh, out of the tumor nests uh, in nets and they are like usually close to vessels. I don't know, Jerome, if you want to comment on that. Um, I think it's not surprising because, you know, they need to extravasate. I think that the, the, the crucial point is, are they specific against the tumor or are they bystander T cells? That's the, the, the crucial point. Yeah, if, if I can add something to this. Yes, I agree with you. So first of all, let's figure out which one is their rule in this, in this uh, setting. But I also think that to answer the question, which one is the mechanism that we should use, I think that uh, it will play a big role, the stage of the disease and really the type of patient that, that you are treating. Because for example, Mauro showed that uh, he's working on TILs uh, from patients that basically were naive from treatment. Uh, few of them, I think, treated with some of the analogs. But then earlier, um, Jerome Cross showed that we have a higher T cell infiltration after uh, treatment. So I think it really depends on the stage, and perhaps this is how I see this. Perhaps T cells is a type of um, immune therapy that is uh, it will work probably or has higher potential to work in a very early setting and then uh, perhaps uh, a different type of engaging in a later setting. Also because we need to learn from the other disease in this case, right? We don't have big experience. And you mentioned, someone mentioned the melanoma experience earlier. Uh, they show when they started uh, comparing uh, TILS therapy with um, um, other treatments, the first uh, comparison that they, they did was with uh, chemotherapy, right? Because they were giving TILs to patients that were already heavily predated. And they showed, of course, that TILs were better, but then when immune therapy with immune checkpoint to cover there, they also were able recently to show, if I'm wrong, that actually TILs had a better rule and were performed better even um, not, not over um, immunotherapy, but if given before immunotherapy, then actually these T cells were performing better. So that's just for saying that I really think that it really depends on the uh, stage of the disease, the treatment that these patients uh, received, and there is a lot to, to learn yet, so yeah. So I might just add that those are all really great points, and uh, they're very T cell focused. And I, I think what we were learning from some of our work is, and, and reading some reviews, there was a beautiful review uh, by Lamont et al. in Nature Review Cancer last year, where they looked at every type of, of cancer and, and really did a global evaluation. Um, they found that the presence of either B cells, but particularly more so plasma cells, uh, was more predictive of patient survival and response to immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy than T cells. Um, and so I, I think if we consider them all together, I mean, they're, they're playing together and they're talking with each other and engaging each other and instructing each other. So I, I think, yeah, if we can have multiple levels of analysis, that would probably be best. But you're absolutely right. The stage at which we're looking in the context is really important. And um, it, these, these tertiary lymphoid structures, they also mature. And so what is their maturity level? Are they really full of all of the immune cells that we want, or are they early stage? And so the, the greater capabilities that we have to do multiplex IHC 
on patient samples, biopsies even, that would, I think, be very powerful for uh, clinicians to be able to see that data and make some predictions about response to therapies and what would be the good therapy. And I think when, when concern is that in all the tumors where the immunotherapy are working very well, the mutation happens very early. And so the tumors is sort of homogeneous for a lot of its neoantigens, MSI, colon cancer, whether it's tobacco or, or UV induced. The, the, the cells that becomes tumor, she already has a lot of its uh, sort of mutation. In PANETS, I'm afraid that a lot of the mutation and the neoantigen that we are seeing, it is from one metastasis to another, which might be a few centimeters away, it's completely different. And so, and, and this is just because of what we've seen with almost untreated tumor. And if we start adding the treatment to this, then within a metastasis, not every, not every single cell. And that's been shown very well when the, the glioblastoma paper or the colorectal cancer, when they do single cell and neoantigen in, in, in a single metastasis, there is very, very few shared neoantigen. I think when the T cells comes in there, it's just, there's, there's not one single cell with the same neoantigen load as the other one. I think that's going to be a real, real challenge for this, you know, focused uh, on one antigen uh, therapy because uh, the, the the more you wait, the greater the diversity, and usually the more you wait, the least efficient is your bone marrow also. You know? Yeah, I believe is uh, only for that the tumor uh, turn on to the from the cold tumor to hot tumor is not enough because the the T cell is a uh, in activation, even you put the vaccine, they make the hot tumor, they don't have a uh, immune cell function. So why the uh, Moderna, the phase two have a successful? Because uh, they only put the, they not only put the vaccine, they also plus the immune checkpoint. So, um, so they get a very good result from the melanoma. They plus the, the immune checkpoint plus the uh, vaccine. So I don't believe it's only uh, put the antigen and make the very hot the tumor is not enough. Another, um, a lot of the companies um, now is uh, uh, not only do the T cell, uh, engineer T cell treatment, they also do the NK cell because the NK cell, they have a good benefit because the NK cell, they don't have the HOA limitation. They much uh, universal. And also T cell activation also have uh, need the uh, NK cell uh, help. So there are a lot of people now working for the NK cell, uh, engineer NK cell treatment. Yeah. And also the NK cell treatment is uh, less uh, toxicity compared to T cell engineer treatment. Yeah. A couple of questions from the back. You were first. Yes, hi. Um, thank you for uh, sharing all your wonderful data um, and your system. It's really encouraging uh, to see all these new uh, findings that uh, you've shared with us. So um, I just have a more technical question for Maro for the TILS. Um, it, did you say that they're actually really sensitive to the freeze-thaw method? Um, in comparison to the renal cell carcinoma, or was it just um, a lower percent to start out with? Now, what I said is that uh, uh, we get a lower T cell yield when we use cryopreserved uh, samples. Um, then, like when you compare the success rate in obtaining a clinically meaningful numbers of TILs. In uh, our experience in uh, PANNET uh, liver metastasis versus uh, renal cell carcinoma, like uh, we uh, have a 45% rate of success that compares favorably uh, with the renal cell carcinoma, um, in which the success rate is 38%. Mm -hmm. When you compare the success rate of our experience with uh, other experiences in uh, breast cancer or melanoma, there they have a 90% success rate. Um, so what I, the, the point I was trying to make is that 45% is not phenomenal, it's not bad. Um, that means that of 10 patients, theoretically, we might have enough cells 
for therapeutic infusion in half of them. That, that is the point I was trying to make. Yeah, okay, thank you. I, I was wondering if you, um, if, if you think that they, the panet tills are maybe biologically also more fragile to, you know, the process of, um, freeze thaw or any manipulation and all that. And, and um, just so like I have, I've always, uh, well, I've, I've been in contact also with other colleagues that uh, are doing uh, similar stuff in uh, other tumor context. I think that uh, this is not something specific to uh, panets. Okay. I think that this is a challenge that uh, we have in the field in general. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know that uh, out there, there are some protocols um, that may help increasing the T cell yield when using uh, cryopreserved samples. Um, but it's a difficulty that uh, a lot of groups are currently experiencing. That's good. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi, um, I just want to say thanks for a really great session. Uh, very interesting stuff and so many different approaches to using or targeting the immune system for therapy. Um, my first question, I have two questions. Um, my first is, what does the panel think in terms of the role of markers such as PDL1, IHC for immune checkpoint inhibitor uh, use in neuroendocrine tumors? And then my second is to follow up on the different populations of, uh, of immune cells and their impact. Um, I believe Dr. Qualify in, interpreted it right. Your treatment with the CDK4, 6 and MEK inhibitors actually induced a decrease in neutrophils. Um, and I, I wonder if, uh, if the panel has uh, any comments on the importance of neutrophils. I can start um, just for your first question about PDL one and how beneficial it is. I, I think that we've learned from multiple cancers that it may not be informative to whether or not a patient would respond or not. Like you don't have to have high levels. But I, there was a recent study, and I think it was out of MD Anderson, that was indicating the glycosylation state of the, of the protein is very critical and very predictive of whether or not you would be responsive. Um, we've been trying to get antibodies to the glycosylated form, and we haven't been able to do it. But uh, I, I think that could be very important, and that would be, it's mainly the glycosylated form at the surface. So I, I think that might be important. It may not be. Um, the other question about neutrophils, I, you know, my husband's more of an immunologist, and I don't know immunology. I'm just learning it. But we, we did see in one of the experiments a significant drop. But in other repeats in, in, with Zhejiang, we did not see a decrease. So I don't know how important it is. We really need to have robust, powered analyses uh, to know whether it's a believable difference. And then I've read in the literature that it can be both beneficial and harmful as far as uh, the tumor to have neutrophils. So they have many facets to their biology, I understand, but uh, maybe others could describe that more intelligently. <laughs> Yeah, I just wanted to add a couple of comments. Uh, so the first one regarding the PD-1, PDL-1 axis, actually reviewing the literature we've also seen, I mean, we all saw the same, right? So probably it's, it's not the pathway that is engaged. There was this recent study at Harvard that showed that actually there was a very low expression of PD-1, PDL-1 in this. Uh, those were, if I remember correctly, all pancreatic nets. Uh, however, uh, they saw other immune checkpoints that might be very interesting, uh, such as TIM3, for example, or VISA, on other cells. And I just wanted to point out that I think a uh, major role will be played uh, by um, myeloid cells. Uh, we really need to explore better this area. They confirmed that, and I think that might be a, a future very interesting topic. Yeah, they certainly can 
demonstrate a range of activation states too. And so that might be important. Yeah, they show that actually, so these cells were activated, were primed in some, somehow, right? Uh, although the um, actual presence of neoantigen was not so high. Uh, th this study didn't study, this study didn't look it up. But we know that, right, those are good to tumor. However, the cells were uh, somehow recognizing the tumor and those were, um, there were, there were a lot of um, regulatory T cells. And, and for sure, we saw other pathway that uh, enhanced um, immune exhaustion, let's say, inactivation. So, yeah. Thanks. All right. Um, thank you, everyone, for a really excellent session. Um, I think we're going to wrap up this um, this session and um, and hand it over to Anna, I guess, for the uh, final wrap up. Oh, Don and Chrissy. Okay. Well, I'll start this while Chrissy's making her way up here. Uh, we just wanted to wrap up the session. Uh, others of you have just given uh, beautiful talks and really rigorous science. This is so exciting to see. I do want to thank on behalf of both of us, the, the board of director members who are here for NetRF and the donors who have spent their time trying to listen to this science and take it in and and uh, feel the palpable excitement that we all have for what we're doing and how we might be able to improve the identification, earlier diagnosis, and then hopefully better treatments for, for those patients who need it. Um, I was struck by how many of you indicated this work was seminal to what you're doing. And, and I can see over the years that some of you had funding a while ago and you're still doing terrific net research. And that's perfect. That's what NetRF would like to see. The, the collaboration that is evident between multiple groups or that some of you have suggested to some of the speakers that's bravo. That's exactly uh, where we want this to go because we're a small community and uh, we might be small, but we're mighty. So uh, I think uh, we can applaud ourselves, but also keep going in that direction. Reach out to each other, share your mice, share your cells, share your ideas or your genetic data with others willingly, and that will help each other make progress in everything that we're doing. And I'll turn it over to Chrissy, who will end, end it for us. <laughs> Thanks, Dawn. Um, I'd also really like to thank Anna for all your hard work in putting this brilliant program together. And keep it, yeah, keeping us all on track, all up to speed. No, thank you. It's been absolutely brilliant. And I think it's run incredibly smoothly. So thank, thanks, Anna. Um, I don't have much more to add alongside um, Dawn's very eloquent words, but what has really struck me over the last couple of days is our real sense of community and bringing us all back together. And so many people have said, this is the best net research meeting I go to every year. And I've heard that time and time and time again. And I'm one of those people that, that says that both inside and, and outside of the symposium. And it's fantastic to welcome some new faces to our community. But overall, it's just to know, to take a step back and really see the legacy of what NetRF has achieved over the last five or 10 years and the legacy in terms of the collaborations that were made here. And you can see them moving on. You know, Dawn's talk was highlighting one of those examples. But actually, I've been seeing new collaborations being made right in front of my eyes throughout the last couple of days. And that's brilliant. And really look forward to, to bringing those experiences back. And then the legacy of what an NetRF does in terms of really supporting people on their, their career development and career progression. So we're all getting older, but you know, in a, in a good way. And it's just great to, to, to see all of that in action in, in front of us. So I think I'll just end there and wish everyone a very, very safe trip home. Um, have a good relaxing weekend, but really, really looking forward to seeing everyone back here next year, but hopefully before at um, some other net related meetings. So thanks very much. <laughs>